What's going on guys? This is Rob and we are back with Moon Knight. Yes, we are. We are covering, I guess, the conclusion of volume one for Moon Knight. So here's the thing. If you go online and you look up Moon Knight volume one, you're basically gonna see six issues. It's really more three is like a story arc. Then you have an interlude story and then you kind of have a two-parter, but the last three issues are really an interlude. So we could probably cover those separate, but this is the important one because it basically builds on, on what we saw in the first issue. As you guys know, in the, the first video that we did with regards to the new Moon Knight run, that's somehow people were basically being controlled, right? And they were seemingly being turned into vampires, which is kind of a weird thing. Now, there's two story arcs going on at the same time here, right? The first story arc is that there are actually vampires that are out there. Now, by and large, what we talked about in the first video is that it really seems to be the motivations and the machinations of Vlad Dracula, right? Building up the vampire nation. And the goal of Dracula, seemingly in the Wolverine comics, uh, seemingly with the Incredible Hulk comics, is that the desire of Dracula is to essentially attain blood that would grant vampires a healing factor so that they can walk around in the daylight like Blade does and not have to worry about being destroyed by the sun. And so while that's going on, that little bit of a vampire story actually kind of segues into this. And what you end up doing is basically picking up with a guy who's just kind of asking these older individuals, like, why are you doing this? And then basically they all kind of chime with the exact same statement, because I want to sport just for the hell of it, right? So these aren't really vampires per se, but they're really more just people who are being controlled. Now, at that point, you switch over to the Midnight Mission, right? And of course, that's the name of the first volume. But the Midnight Mission is essentially what uh, what Mark Spector has now, right? Where he's basically kind of like a Heroes for Hire-esque guy, where he protects people in the area, right? In his neighborhood, but he basically does so at night. So people can just kind of show up there as they need to, ask for help, and he'll respond. Now, as we know from the first video, that Reese is basically one of the, the newly turned vampires that he had rescued. And Reese is amazing. <laughs> I love the character of Reese. Like, when Mark Spector asks her, like, how do your parents feel about you, like, being a vampire and, like, working here with me and that kind of a thing? I mean, she's like, well, they're as happy with my new condition as they are with me working for a guy who runs around in a white hood. So, like, that's kind of a funny little reference. <laughs> I kind of dig that. But, like, Reese is kind of like this no-nonsense woman, right? Like, sure, Mark Spector saved her. And there is loyalty there. But it's also one of those, like, I'm not your servant, right? Like, if you want something, do it yourself. So, he basically has an assistant that just doesn't really do anything unless she wants to do it right so an assistant who works on her own terms but in the middle of all this suddenly that guy who was seemingly attacked shows up here right now again that's the nature of the midnight mission right like you're that crazy freaky guy that everybody talks about that they say like if you need help come and talk to you i need help right and then of course reese chimes in and saying that like she knows who this guy is that this guy's name is soldier and he lives in one of the tenements that basically exists you know around the corner from him of course a tenement basically being a building for those of you guys who don't know a tenement is a building like an apartment building that only ever has one entrance so like you guys have seen those buildings where like you walk through a main door and then you have to take like stairs up to the top to the top apartments or stairs down to the bottom apartments or like there's some right in front of you that's a tenement building and so of course it's one of those things where he kind of explains what's going on when he asks them like you know what what happened like you know like was it an elderly person with like a knife or a hammer or something like that and he says it was a whole bunch of them right like it was a whole bunch of elderly people who basically attacked him at the same time now it's one of those things where jed mckay is also kind of messing with us at the same time right like this young guy was attacked by a bunch of old people <laughs> but the thing here is that Soldier basically says that one of the elderly people who attacked him was his mom. More so than that, he just wasn't really keen on attacking a bunch of old people, right? I mean, you know, granted his life was in danger, but you're talking about a bunch of old people where like a, a good shot to the head, they'll basically be finished with all their living. Like they are a, a portion of society where they can be easily hurt, right? So it's not one of those things where you just rush headlong into attacking old people. And I don't think many, many people would be okay with that, right? like a person just beat up a bunch of old people like there's no real way to turn that story with a positive light right there's not really any circumstance where you could say yes i beat up 15 old people last night but here's what happened and then people would say oh okay i understand there's no circumstance <laughs> where that's going to be acceptable and so one of the things that happens here and this is kind of a cool little thing and i feel like this is going to be a plot device going forward is that with reese having helped soldier essentially recover due to all the various injuries he's sustaining and so on and so forth while mark is tending to him she gets blood on her hands and then she kind of starts to succumb to the bloodlust right the desire to consume blood she of course runs right she's like no nah, i don't want to have anything to do with this and she basically backs off and then just ends up taking off but i feel like there's going to be a bit of a plot point more so than that because mark specter is essentially harboring vampires here you guys have to know it's only a matter of time before blade shows up and i am excited to cover that story right it's gonna be super clickbait moon knight versus blade that's gonna be a ridiculously clickbait type for a video. <laughs> 
<laughs> I mean, tell me you wouldn't watch that. If you if you post a comment telling me, no, Rob, I would not watch a video where Moon Knight fights Blade, I wouldn't believe you. Not even for one second. I'd be like, you're lying. Like, you are absolutely going to watch that video. And I'm excited to cover that story. <laughs> but regardless, as they basically kind of make their way around and get back to where the in initial incident basically takes place, that what you have is a janitor that works in this building named Holly. And that what happens is Holly, you know, when he's, when, when the soldier's like, hey, my bad, man, you know, we just need to step through here real quick. He says, no problem, sport. Now, the important thing here is that when Mark was talking to soldier, that he talked about how all the old people kept referring to him as sport. So seemingly, it tells us more or less what's going on right and so mark specter kind of picks up on that initially but once they get in there and they kind of start looking around for soldier's mom of course she cannot necessarily be found soldier's like i gotta get my gun when mark steps out all these different old people start attacking him and that's when you find out holly is the one behind this right that where mark breaks out his little little battering stuff like this that like you know it's kind of like okay holly's the guy behind this now before you dismiss this and you think it's dumb i mean it kind of is but like there's this ridiculously amazing moment that happens here right so what you end up finding out with Holly is that he's not that dissimilar from the Purple Man, right? Zebedai Kilgrave emits pheromones, and that unless you have an incredibly strong level of willpower, or you have a kind of telepathic protection that blocks those, those pheromones from being able to intercept your neurons, that you will succumb to him. And so what Holly had been doing is that because it's his sweat that basically drives people to essentially follow him, that he'd have to kind of like, you know, force you to ingest his sweat, which no one's running around and licking the the bald head of Holly, right? What he actually ended up doing was basically poisoning the water supply in the building. And he never really considered it to be like a big thing, right? He never really considered himself as a person who had a huge level of imagination. And what he actually says here is he did this at the request of somebody else, right? Somebody asked him to, basically came to him and said, hey, you should do this, right? You should kind of, you know, do this a little bit and get the attention of Moon Knight. And so using older people to basically do his bidding, that where this initially presents a circumstance where they're brandishing like knives and stuff like that, the response of of moon knight is actually here's a, here's a deal i'll make with you what you're doing here is small time stuff right controlling elderly people in some tenement building somewhere this is small stuff i know people who can do things like this on a much broader scale and i'm an avenger right or at least i have been an avenger i've got ties to the superhero community what you're doing here is you're wreaking havoc in a tenement building imagine what you could do if you had me under your control you kind of you, you say you have no real imagination here what i think is you just haven't really found a worthy challenge yet and so this kind of goads the ego of holly to a degree and so mark's like here's what we'll do take this little crescent ring and apply your sweat to it and then i'll consume your sweat which is weird but he's like i'll consume your sweat and then you and me right brain to brain we'll see who really is the tougher of the two of us now here's the funny thing about this right that it's not one of these things where mark's pulling a ruse where like he's gonna like trick holly and then punch him in the face you know and then or whatever that he actually is going through with this the funny thing here is mark says here's the thing holly you've never seen anything like what's in my head and i'm not talking about you know some kind of mental illness i'm sure something like disassociative identity disorder is old hat for you right you've dealt with people who have multiple personalities and you dominated all of them he says after all you're used to sharing space in someone's head he says let me show you something new you who have touched any number of minds how does it feel to touch the truly alien the universe is composed almost entirely of darkness holly it's the default state an uncaring indifferent nothing cold and impenetrable little wonder then when early men looked up from the terrifying darkness of night beset by predators on all sides and worse and then they saw light they worshipped it as a god mine is the cold fire of the moon mine is the tidal pull on the salt blood beating through your heart mine is the silver madness that illuminates but does not warm and he says come and worship it is amazing right it's just see here's 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 the thing man like here's here's something to know about moon knight right here's here's the thing moon knight's one of those characters where if he's written decently you feel it right it's like okay i mean whatever like it's a moon knight comic when he's written well he's phenomenal and it's one of those those crazy cool things right because he says my brain is moon silver lunatic cratered with a god's fingerprints the deep structures of my mind have been irreversibly changed by community 
communion with an ultra terrestrial intelligence. This is my poisoned ground. This is my temple. But I take my weaknesses and turn them to my advantage. I take my scars and make them my weapons. And so in essence, what he does, and this is actually a really, really important moment here. One of the big questions you had to ask is like, what's going on with the other personalities, right? If Mark Spector is the one who's basically running the show here, what's going on with the personalities of like Steve Grant and Jake Lockley? Like what you find out is like following the run of Jeff Lemire, Rick Remender, whoever it was that wrote it, that basically Mark Spector's in total control of his personalities and has seemingly locked them away. And that's what he does with Holly. He basically takes the mind of Holly, right? Like literally takes his mind and locks it away, imprisons it in his, in, in literally in the mind of Mark Spector. So there's nothing Lockley can do that once it's all said and done, Lockley's just in a comatose state, right? He's literally a body without a mind. That's basically what's going on. And so imprisoning him in his own mind is huge because it gives us a few, a few understandings understandings of what's going on with Mark. One, that Mark has total control of his faculties. And two, the supernatural element of Moon Knight is not lost. It's not gone. It's still very much a part of him. And that's one of those things that we had to contend with because we didn't really know if that was the case. That during the Avengers story arc by Jason Aaron, when Khonshu was basically defeated and locked away, and Mark had walked away, quote unquote, from being a direct fist of Khonshu and started doing his own thing, were his powers cut off with it? Was he basically just a guy who's entirely more with no supernatural connections whatsoever, just running around in the night and like fighting people, or does he still have abilities? And the answer to that is, he still has powers. This is huge and it's really, really cool because once the day's saved and everything is essentially over, that you end up finding out that he's being watched by Badir. Now, switching over to that is a cool thing because as Mark's talking to his therapist, he literally tells her like, I have an enemy, right? There is somebody out there. And it's one of those things where the conversation between Mark and his therapist are as much existential as they are direct, right? That Mark, without having Khonshu telling him where to go and what to do, to a degree is almost kind of flying by the seat of his pants, right? That the bottom sort of fell out. But at the same time, there's a level of freedom that he hadn't really experienced before. That he's able to go forward as basically the fist of Khonshu, seemingly with all his powers intact, but he's not beholden to the whimsical desires of a moon god, right? That he's basically doing his own thing. But the biggest concern that he has is that this enemy that exists out there, that he's almost kind of afraid it's himself. Now, he doesn't give a definitive answer as to why, but we could speculate that perhaps he's developing a new personality. That this new personality takes over and then starts instructing people to do things and basically Mark Spector creates his own enemies in order to serve his purpose of being the fist of Khonshu. It's entirely possible that's the case. That kind of thing has happened in the past. A more direct answer here is that the sins of his own past are basically catching up to him. And in fact, in his conversation with Badir, that seemed to be the case, right? That Badir basically illustrated that he, or at least made this declaration that he was a fist of Khonshu. He was kind of the, the other hand and that he's coming after Mark. And so because because of this, you end up finding out that essentially one of the other people that Mark had taken in, one of the other vampires that he had basically been been kind of watching out for, that they were coming after him, right? That they were basically trying to take out these different people. That somebody had basically tried to kill Ted. And of course, while I wouldn't say that seemingly recent Ted are like the best friends, that like they share a kind of common bond, right? So they're very similar to like the Midnight Suns in that way. I mean, they're not best buds, right? They're not BFFs. They don't go and do stuff all the time, or at least that doesn't seem to be the case. But regardless. Ted is somebody that was being chased after by someone. And that when Reese pulls out the crescent moon of Moon Knight, she doesn't really blame him, right? I mean, she knows what he was doing at the time. She knows that he was tracking down leads. But the question is, who's doing this, right? Like who's coming after these things? And so Mark pulls it together pretty quickly. That is basically Badir. He doesn't really dump that information to Reese, but he's like, I, you know, more or less he knows what's going on. And so as a result, he actually ends up kind of making his way through rooftops and so on, and really just trying to draw the attention of Badir, which happens. And a fight breaks out between the two of them. Now, this is the cool thing about what Jed McKay is doing here, that when Moon Knight has gotten into fights with people in the past, they're usually pretty straightforward. They're not overly complex. And that Moon Knight usually gets the upper hand pretty fast. In this instance, but here gets the upper hand of him, right? Like he literally, he, he overpowers Moon Knight so incredibly quickly. And in fact, when Moon Knight asks him like, who are you supposed to be? The response of Badir is, I'm the Hunter's Moon, right? I'm the other fist of Khonshu. And it's this really, really cool concept because as they're talking, Mark's like, no, I told you I was the 
fist of Kanchu and that's it. But the response of, of Badir says, but every man has two fists, Mark. Surely you weren't so arrogant or stupid as to believe that our God only has one hand, right? Surely you had to know that if you are a fist of Kanchu, there had to be a second one out there somewhere. And so it's cool because the response of Adir is not necessarily to destroy Mark, right? It's not to like kill him and then wipe him out. That instead they're supposed to operate kind of at the same time, right? They're like the left hand knows what the right hand's doing, but they're supposed to complement each other. That as a fist of Kanchu, there are things that Mark is supposed to be doing. More so than that, one of the things Badir says is like, you've taken vampires in, right? We as the fists of Kanchu are here to basically protect those who walk during the night and to destroy those who prowl during the night. What do vampires do, Mark? Vampires feed in the night. You've literally taken in the sworn enemy of Kanchu, or at least one of them, right? Like, they are predators. They are the antithesis of Kanchu. They literally exist to be the opposite of us. And then you've taken them in, right? You are protecting some of them. That's not what you're supposed to be doing. And so one of the things that goes on is that Mark looks at the situation with Holly and then asks, like, Madeir, why did you send him here? And Madeir's like, what are you talking about? I had nothing to do with that. And so literally, like, there's another force at play here, right? There's something else going on. And so as they kind of continue to fight, one of the things that happens is that that Badir basically says like, I don't understand you, right? Like, I don't like what's wrong with you. I'm not referencing your, your softness for vampires or anything like that. It's the way you move, Mark Spector, the way you fought. You are a fist of Kanchu, but there's nothing of beauty in the way that you fight, right? You fight with a kind of recklessness, right? You fight with no real sophistication. There's no real fluidity in your movements. You are basically basically just kind of punching and, and hammering away what's going on. He says like, you fight like an animal, right? You should move with skill and prowess of every fist to ever serve Kanchu as I do. Did you not receive the gift of the chorus upon your ordination? Were the memories of Kanchu's previous fists not invested in your mind? This is huge because what this is Jed McKay doing is basically expanding everything. It's not dissimilar to what Ed Brubaker and Matt Fraction did with the Iron Fist run. Do you guys remember that? For years and years and years and years, there was just Danny Rand the Iron Fist, right? Like a person who left Kun Loon with the ability to use the Iron Fist, went back to New York, and was basically a street level superhero who was also like ultra rich. But that during the Ed Brubaker and Matt Fraction run, you learned that Danny Rand was just the more recent Iron Fist. Before him, there was like Orson Randall. And before Orson Randall, there were a host of other Iron Fists. That the tournament of the seven heavenly cities and so on was a great big, huge part of this mythos that we never knew about. That's what it looks like is going on here that what was supposed to happen when Mark Spector became a fist of Kanchu is that he would be bestowed all the knowledge of all the different fists that came before him but for whatever reason that didn't seem to happen and that even with Mark himself he's like I already had too many personalities in my head right so it looks like Jed McKay is basically expanding on the Moon Knight powers and, and repertoire and so on right that Moon Knight himself that Mark Spector will probably see an increase in his powers and an expansion in what he's capable of the the longer this story goes on. And that's what's so cool is because Badir's like, you are far more broken than I thought you were, right? Like your connection or whatever it is that you were supposed to be, you are not a true fist. You did not undergo the process that fists of Kanshu undergo when they become a servant of him. Somewhere along the line, you've been broken. And so the intention of Badir is to basically fix him to get him back to where he's supposed to be. And so one of the things he says is like, your connections to the people around you, that's what makes you weak. And he says, I will make you fit for your duty. After I remove the distractions from your life, it will be easier for you after that. And basically goes after all the different friends, essentially, of, of uh, Mark Spector at the Midnight Mission. And then, like, once he busts in and immediately starts going after all of them, he basically disarms them all with the intention of basically beating them all to death. And then, of course, Mark shows up and then crushes this guy, right? He doesn't kill him. He absolutely crushes him. Now, this is an important thing that I hope you guys are noticing here, that in these different moments, right? When Mark was dealing with Holly, that when Mark is dealing with, with this guy, right? Dealing with, uh, with Badir, it's almost like he becomes a different person, right? It's almost like a different aspect of him takes over. He says like, at the end of the day, you're just a doctor dancing in borrowed shoes. And he says, that's why I win. And then when Badir says like, you are, you're being an absolute fool. The response of Mark is probably, and more of one still for letting you live tonight. But know this, before you decide to come after frightened children under my protection again, whomever or whatever they might be, you better have what it takes to kill me for good. Because when I come back, and I always do, 
I'll do you like they did Osiris. They'll never find all your pieces. And he says, so go, Fist of Khonshu, drag yourself away from my temple and avoid my attention in the future, lest I become even more interesting. That he basically seems to have this kind of darker side that just takes over him, right? Even if it's not a drastic shift in his personality, it's minimal, it's small, but it's like he becomes a different person. But with that being said, guys, we're gonna bring this to an end. Let me know what you guys think about Jed McKay's uh, Moon Knight run so far. I love it, man. It is phenomenal. It's some of the most interesting writing that I've seen for the character of Moon Knight in years. But thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you all later. Peace.